Good morning. My name is Taylor Sutton. I'm one of the pastors here. Would you join me in prayer as we prepare to open God's Word together? Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would show us Christ this morning. Use your Word. May you cause my words to be faithful to your Word and useful to my brothers and sisters here. Open our hearts to who you are and what you have to say to us. Amen. Well, one commodity of which we are in no danger of running out is human opinion. You may have noticed that there are a lot of opinions about a great many things. Uh, People are full of opinions. And in the midst of all these opinions and the debates that rage on about all kinds of topics, we can sometimes forget that on some topics, Jesus has an opinion. We're starting a series this morning called Jesus Has Something to Say About That. And what we're going to do in this series is look at passages from the Gospels in which Jesus speaks to people, interacts with them, and in doing so, confronts and corrects something. And as we do that, the hope is that we ourselves would be open to being confronted and corrected by the Lord Jesus. This morning, I want to submit to you, maybe not very controversially, but I want to submit to you that Jesus has something to say about religion. Jesus has something to say about religion. Now, when I say the word religion, I do not mean that in a negative or a a pejorative sense. I, I simply mean, this morning, by the term religion, those beliefs and practices that are intended to facilitate people connecting with the transcendent. A different way to say that would be that religion is simply people seeking God together. Now, one of the more notable and talked about trends of the last couple decades has been the steep decline in religious participation in America. When researchers look at rates of church attendance, belief in God, even just basic religious affiliation, what they're finding is that these rates are in decline pretty significantly. Now, some observers look at that and are concerned. They see a a danger in the the kinds of social problems that arise from the things that, that rush in to fill the vacuum left by traditional religious participation. What a lot of people are pointing out is that, at least in our case, less religion means more loneliness. It means more political polarization means more pessimism. So that's one concern. On the other hand, there are others saying that the real danger is religion. And these people would say, the reason so many people are running away from churches and other kinds of religious communities is that they're no longer willing to tolerate the scandals and the manipulation And the hypocrisy that can seem to be endemic, almost built in to religion. So, what does Jesus have to say about religion? Well, I invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. This morning, we're going to look at Luke 19, verse 45 through Luke 20. Verse 18. 
Luke 19.45 is where we will begin this morning. Let's hear God's word together. Luke 19, 45. And he, that is Jesus, entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up and said to him, tell us by what authority you do these things, or who it is that gave you this authority. He answered them, I also will ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third. This one also they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, Surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone shall be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. This text reveals a simple yet profound truth. Religion without Jesus is empty. Religion of any kind without Jesus is empty. Luke, the gospel writer, shows us this simple yet profound truth across three scenes. In this text, we have three encounters between Jesus, who has just entered Jerusalem, and leaders who dominate the religious life of Jerusalem. And so each of these scenes is really a a clash of authority. And so we're going to look at each of these three and consider what it might mean for us. So first, scene number one, Jesus exercises his authority by clearing out the temple. Jesus exercises his authority by clearing out the temple. This is in chapter 19, verses 45 to 48. Look at verse 45 again. 
It says, he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. So Jesus' problem here is not simply the fact that buying and selling is happening. It was necessary for people to buy the animals that they would sacrifice. It was necessary for them to exchange currencies so that they could pay the temple tax that was actually required by the law of Moses. The issue, the problem that Jesus has is where these activities are happening. They're happening in the temple, which is supposed to be a place where people draw near to God. It's a house of prayer. It was designed to be by God himself, in a very real sense, his dwelling place among his people. And so Jesus is insisting that that reality be respected. Now, this is an explosive thing for him to do because it really amounts to an assertion of his own authority over the most holy sacred site in all of Israel. He is implicitly claiming to be the king over this temple. It's a pretty audacious claim for a traveling rabbi from the backwaters of Galilee. But it gets worse because not only is Jesus nothing but a traveling rabbi from the backwaters of Galilee, at least in the sight of the leaders of Jerusalem, the temple already has people in charge of it. That would be the chief priests. And lo and behold, look who shows up in verse 47. Verse 47 says, And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him. So the chief priests in particular would have been the official designated caretakers, gatekeepers, authority figures responsible for the life and the worship of the temple in Jerusalem. And so not surprisingly, they are not pleased with what Jesus just did. It reminds me a little bit of the 1939 film, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. The main character, Jefferson Smith, he's plucked from obscurity and appointed to the U.S. Senate. And he shows up in Washington and he is a nobody from nowhere. And the expectation on him from everyone around him is that he would just keep his head down and stay out of the way of the people who are actually in charge who are actually running things. And when Mr. Smith does not cooperate, he soon faces severe opposition. And it's no different with Jesus. So this is the first scene. Jesus exercises his authority by clearing out the temple. Let's move on now to scene number two. In scene number two, the religious leaders fight back. The religious leaders fight back. Once again, we're in the temple in Jerusalem. Look at verse 1 in chapter 20. This second scene is chapter 20, verses 1 through 8. And verse 1 says, One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up and said to him, Tell us by what authority you do these things, or who it is that gave you this authority. So their question is, their, their challenge is, what right do you have to come in here and act like you're in charge? On what basis are you acting like this? That's the question. That's the very public challenge to Jesus's authority. And how he answers this is very interesting. Look at what he says in verse 3. He answered them, I will also ask you a question. 
And the question is, verse 4, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Now, this may look like Jesus is simply changing the subject to avoid uh, a hard question. But actually, the, the question of John's ministry and where it came from is directly relevant to the question that they just asked him. Because if you look early in the uh, first few chapters of Luke, Luke tells us that John the Baptist was God's designated forerunner, herald, preparing the people of Israel for the Messiah. And it was at John's baptism of Jesus that the Father's voice from heaven sounded, this is my beloved son. So the, the logic of John the Baptist and Jesus is, if John's ministry is from God, then Jesus' authority is also from God. But what's interesting is Jesus, rather than asserting that logic, he turns it around into a question and, and forces the religious leaders to go on record about where they stand regarding John the Baptist's ministry. And we see their internal deliberations in verses 5 and 6, which makes it clear that they had a problem because they did not think that John was actually from God. So it makes sense that they're not prepared to accept Jesus. But they realized that they were out of step with the majority of popular opinion. Most observant Jewish people believed they were convinced that John was a prophet, that John spoke with divine authority. And so what Jesus does is he takes their challenge of his authority and he turns it around into a question that they don't want to answer, which then exposes before the people their own hardness of heart, even their own hypocrisy. Look at what verse 7 says. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So they fight back but it doesn't go very well for them. That's scene number two. So scene one, Jesus exercises his authority. Scene two, the religious leaders fight back. And then now we come to scene three, where Jesus rejects the authority of the religious leaders. Jesus rejects the authority of the religious leaders. And he does this in the form of a parable. A symbolic story. Look at verse 9. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. There's a little bit of background here that helps us understand what Jesus is doing. The metaphor of Israel as a vineyard was a well-known one ever since the prophet Isaiah had used that metaphor hundreds of years before. So it's pretty clear from the get-go that the vineyard is Israel. It's the people of Israel. And so the tenants are the leaders. The servants whom the landowner sends are the prophets, and the landowner is none other than God the Father. So the setup is, is straightforward enough. The leaders of Israel were entrusted with authority over the people in order to do them good and also to facilitate a harvest of fruitfulness that would be dedicated to, to Yahweh, to the God the Father. But what happens? They... they reject the prophets, they reject the servants who are sent, until the parable reaches its shocking climax. Look at verse 13. The owner, the owner of the vineyard, at a loss for what to do, decides, I will send my son, my beloved son, perhaps they will respect him. Verse 14, but when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard 
and killed him. So it's meant to be surprising. It's not, it's not a good plan on the part of the tenants to do this. That's part of the point of the story. But it's also part of the point of the story that Jesus puts himself in the parable here. Jesus implicitly is answering the question from the previous scene. He is the son of God. That's the authority that he has to rule over and direct and reform God's temple and the worship of God's people. And in just a few days, just a few days after this interaction, he too will be killed. So we know from other parts of Luke and other parts of the New Testament that even the death of Jesus was part of the plan. But the emphasis here is not so much on that reality. It's on the consequences that the religious leaders will receive for their rejection of Jesus. That's the issue that Jesus presses at the end. Look at verse 15 again. He asks the question, what then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Verse 19, which we didn't read earlier, makes it clear that the the religious leaders knew that he was talking about them. So what's he saying? Well, Jesus is saying that because of their unfaithfulness, their hard-heartedness, their rejection of the prophets culminating in their rejection of Jesus, God will remove the spiritual religious authority of these leaders and give that authority to someone else. And that someone else is Jesus and his apostles. So their rejection of him is a serious matter indeed. And so Jesus tells this parable to express in his own way his rejection of them and their authority. So we've seen these three scenes. Jesus exercises his authority The religious leaders fight back. They push back on that assertion of authority. But then Jesus rejects their authority. And what I'm arguing is that all of this is is being put before us by Luke to say that religion without Jesus is empty. And think about about just how high the stakes are here. Consider what we're talking about. This is the faith of Israel. Israel. This is the one true religion. This is the one religion on earth whose practices and beliefs and institutions were authorized by God himself. Yet even that religion, Jesus is saying, is empty without him. Now, how can he say that? How can that be warranted? The reason that is warranted is because of who Jesus is, that Jesus is the fulfillment of every element of the faith of Israel. He is the temple to which the brick and mortar temple was merely a picture. He is the true high priest of which the priesthood of Aaron and his sons was merely a preview. He is the king sitting on David's throne to which the dynasty of David was simply a prelude. So to try to hold on to the temple and the priesthood and the Davidic dynasty without Jesus is to be holding on to nothing of substance. It's like, it's like if somebody gave you a ticket to the Super Bowl and you didn't go, you did not go, but you, you held on to the ticket and you saved it and you cherished it as a precious artifact. The whole point of the ticket is to facilitate your experience of this event. So to, to cherish and prize the ticket and ignore the event that it gets you access to is ludicrous. 
But that, in, in a nutshell, is the faith of Israel without Jesus. That's Judaism without Jesus. And if that is true of the one religion in history that God instituted, how much more so for any other religion? Here's, here's the bottom line for every person in the world. Any pathway to God or to the transcendent or to the ultimate, any pathway to God that bypasses Jesus is a dead end. Religion without Jesus is empty. But there's a sobering implication of that that we need to think about, which is that Christianity without Jesus is empty. In the novel, The Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky, there's this fascinating story inside the novel. One of the characters in the story tells a, a fictional story about Jesus. And in this fictional story, Jesus himself comes down to earth briefly during the Spanish Inquisition. So he goes to Spain in the 1500s, in the middle of the Spanish Inquisition, and he starts quietly healing people, doing the kinds of things that Jesus did in the Gospels. But very quickly, he gets arrested by a Roman Catholic cardinal who is the Grand Inquisitor of the Spanish Inquisition. And at night, this cardinal comes to Jesus in prison and speaks with him. Now, the cardinal in the story knows that it's Jesus, or at least he strongly suspects that this is Jesus returning to earth. But this is what he says to him. The cardinal says to Jesus, you have no right to add anything to what you already said once. Why then have you come to interfere with us? Here's the sobering reality, friends. It is possible to use Christianity for our own purposes while leaving Jesus behind. Let me suggest three ways, not exhaustive, but three ways that we can use Christianity for our purposes and bypass, ignore the Lord Jesus. First of all, we can use Christianity to get other people to do what we want them to do. We can use Christianity to get other people to do what we want them to do. This happens when parents use Christianity to improve their kids' behavior while simultaneously not submitting to Christ themselves. This is what happens when church leaders exploit the people of the church rather than serve the people of the church. This is what happens when someone uses the Bible to manipulate and coerce and control. And when that happens repeatedly and intentionally, that's spiritual abuse. That's, that's an extreme and ugly fruit of Christianity without Jesus. We can use Christianity for our purposes while ignoring him. Second way we do this, that we can do this, is that we can use Christianity to hide from our deep need for Jesus. We can use Christianity to hide from our deep need for Jesus. The writer Flannery O'Connor described one of her characters this way. There was a deep, black, wordless conviction in him that the way to avoid Jesus was to avoid sin. And Tim Keller cites that statement from Flannery O'Connor and then adds this description, this warning. 
Keller writes, you can avoid Jesus as Savior by keeping all the moral laws. If you do that, then you have rights, quote unquote. God owes you. He owes you answered prayers and a good life and a ticket to heaven when you die. You don't need a Savior who pardons you by free grace, for you are your own Savior. Are you using the ethics of Christianity to prop up a sense of your own respectability, your own morality, so that you can avoid an honest reckoning with how deeply flawed and broken you are? Friend, if that's you, my plea with you is, Stop hiding from Jesus and run to him. We can use Christianity, though, to hide from our need for Jesus. The third way we can do this is we can use Christianity to construct a Savior who is not our Lord. We can use Christianity to construct a Savior who is not our Lord. Many people today are prepared to accept a version of Jesus that always forgives them and never requires them to change. But that is not the real Jesus. And praise God for that. Here's part of our problem. We tend to think of the authority of Jesus as an unwelcome intrusion into the freedom that we would otherwise enjoy. Kind of like a nagging boss calling you on the weekend to give you more work to do when you just want to relax. But the reality is that the authority of Jesus is more like his command to Lazarus, lying dead in his grave. Lazarus, come out. And he does. You see, Jesus in all of his royal authority, he's not trying to clip your wings. He's seeking to raise you from the dead. So that that sin that you're not sure you really want to let go of, it's not freedom, friends. It's a tomb. It's slavery. And the authority of Jesus in all of his power and grandeur and grace is saying to you, come out of the tomb. There was a a confession of faith, a brief confession of faith that was uh, common among the, the very first Christians. And it was simply, Jesus is Lord. And one of the things that we so desperately need in our age of unbridled individualism is we have to recover a deep conviction that it is good news that Jesus is Lord. And the reason that we can be confident that it's good news is because of the kind of Lord He is. There is no other king like Jesus. There is no other wielder of authority, authorized or unauthorized, like Jesus. Because this very story is embedded in the final week of Jesus' life, where he comes to Jerusalem, claiming in every way he can, I'm in charge of this place. And yet at the same time, he comes to Jerusalem to die, to sacrifice his own life to rescue, redeem, forgive, restore his own enemies, you and me, anyone who will trust in him. That's the kind of Lord we're talking about in Luke chapters 19 and 20. So the authority of Jesus, the authority of Jesus is actually our protection from the dangers of religion 
without Jesus. And the authority of Jesus is also our protection from all the dangers that come from the rivals and the replacements of religion. Religion without Jesus is empty. But praise God, Jesus is Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it is our desire to gladly submit to your gracious reign. You are the king. You are the crucified and resurrected one. You are the one sitting at the Father's right hand, and you will return to judge the living and the dead. You are our hope. Lord Jesus, would you have mercy on us for the countless ways our hearts wander away from your rule and reign and authority. Forgive us for the ways that we construct versions of you that serve our own interests without actually submitting to you. Have mercy on us for viewing your authority as a heavy and unwelcome intrusion. Forgive us for ignoring you. Forgive us for chasing after lesser gods and lesser kings. Lord Jesus, have mercy on us to forgive, but also to transform. Would you wield your mighty authority by the Holy Spirit to make us new? We love you and we thank you. And we are are trusting and we are looking to you. Amen.